This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. New science predicts chaotic climate with bigger changes in temperatures year to year. Our next guest told Scientific American, quote, This unpredictability is going to prove extremely disruptive for all of us and will make adaptation and planning much more difficult, end quote. And the driver for all of that comes from the furthest ends of the Earth. It's not what you would expect. We're going to talk about ice melt on Antarctica and Greenland, and yes, that will affect you. There is also a small sliver of possibly better news. The most apocalyptic predictions for sea level rise may not happen. Our guest, Nicholas Gollich, is lead author of one paper just published in Nature and co-author of another. He has 68 more peer-reviewed scientific papers to his credit. Educated in Scotland, Associate Professor Nick Golich is currently with the Antarctic Research Centre, and that's at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. From Wellington, Nick, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you. So I gather it's been a crazy busy week for you, Nick, with the media calling from all over the world? It was very busy last week, yeah. So it's um, nice that uh, we got a lot of coverage. So, yeah, very happy about that. It's an important story. Now, you begin your new work by assuming that despite the aims of the Paris Agreement, the global mean temperature will exceed the alleged safe limits, going towards 2.6, maybe even to 4 degrees C beyond pre-industrial. Why do you think that's a scenario that you should work with? Those numbers basically come from the Climate Action Tracker, which is an online resource which uses climate model scenarios to basically forecast the range of warming that we're likely to reach by 2100, uh, taking into account the the various government pledges. It's it's a dynamic website that they update periodically as governments either improve or or remove some of their their climate pledges. So that number has kind of changed a little bit over the last uh, couple of years because of uh, electoral changes in some countries. But, yeah, for the last year or two, it's been fairly set on um, predicting more than three degrees warming by 2100. And we won't mention any names like the United States or Brazil and all that. Okay, so when the governments met in Katowice, Poland in December 2018, did the projections given to them by international scientists include the impacts of ice sheet discharge? Well, of course, I I can't um, say specifically what was given to them, but I think um, globally most policymakers are still using predictions from the last IPCC uh, assessment, the AR5 assessment, which was uh, completed in 2013. I know for sure that none of the climate models that were used in that assessment included the effects of ice sheet melt. Now, of course, the IPCC was tasked with delivering some special reports, uh, which are beginning to come online now. So in some of those reports, they may be at least referring to some of the literature which talks about these effects. But um, there's always this sort of slight latency between, you know, when we do the science and how quickly that can get into, you know, both into publication and into big documents like IPCC assessments. So it's partly just fault of the process. And, um, you know, I think as scientists and communicators, we actually need to find faster mechanisms to get our message to decision makers. Well, there's a couple of things we need to talk about here. One is the changes in ocean currents that could destabilize the weather, especially in the northern hemisphere. And then there's sea level rise. And I'd like to start with that. On Radio EcoShock, at least a dozen scientists have said sea level rise, not heat will be the great game-changer emerging out of a shifting climate. And it's, you know, about disappearing port cities, millions of people displaced, uh, agricultural problems, and so on. But the predictions for sea level rise by 2100 have been all over the place, Nick. They, they run from a low of just 30 centimeters, or about one foot, to as much as 7 meters, or 21 feet. Nick, why is there such a difference, all coming from pretty good scientists? Yeah, uh, this is something that people rightly uh, pick up on. And I think we need to break this down into some of the individual components. You know, when we think about global mean sea level rise, what we're talking about is very much an average value across the globe that comes from a range of different things. You know, we've got a a thermal expansion component, uh, which is, you know, fairly well understood. And we can kind of predict that fairly well based on predicted warming. 
Um, we've got the contribution that comes from mountain glaciers and ice caps, and of course they tend to respond fairly linearly to warming air temperature, so they're fairly predictable as well. And then we have the, the big problem with the ice sheets, and we've got Greenland, which generally responds to the atmosphere mainly, um, so it's a, a surface mass balance issue. So again, we can kind of predict that fairly well in terms of you know, how it responds to a, a warming world. And it, actually, the model simulations for Greenland, um, there is some variability, obviously, between the models, but uh, the ones that include dynamic contributions as well as surface melting, they give a little extra um, contribution to sea level, but there's not a huge difference. The real elephant in the room, as you allude to, is, is the Antarctic ice sheet, and particularly the dynamic contribution that comes from Antarctica. So in the last IPCC report, in AR5, they separated out the contribution that they thought would come from Antarctica based on just changes in temperature, air temperature, the, the surface mass balance. Uh, and then they, they put in an estimate for what they thought could come from rapid ice dynamics. And the reason they had to estimate it was because at the time there weren't sufficiently uh, complex ice sheet models um, that, that could really simulate this kind of rapid ice dynamic behavior. Now, since then, the community has responded to that. Uh, we now have many more ice sheet models that can do this kind of stuff but, you know, we're still trying to get to grips with how we deal with the processes we know about. But then there's also the wild card of processes that we, you know, we, we maybe know about but haven't included in models. And, and so some of the very high estimates that came out in 2016 were based on one particular paper that, where the authors decided to put in some mechanisms that we see in Greenland but we don't see in Antarctica. And they basically scaled them up and said, wow, look at this, you know, we get, we get huge sea level rise. Now, those authors are now bringing their numbers back down. They presented new work at AGU last year, which considerably revised downward the 2100 predictions from uh, around a meter back down to 30 centimeters or so um, from Antarctica. So there's big changes there. The rest of the community are still trying to get to grips with whether it's a, a scheme that we need to incorporate. I mean, for sure, we need to investigate it and understand how it works, how it's likely to play out. Uh, but these are all very, very active areas of scientific research and, and in some cases quite sort of heated discussion. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's frustrating for us as a community, I think, to find so much variability in, in the predictions because it, it kind of makes us look like we don't really know what we're doing. But actually, I'd say that over the last year or two, we're beginning to understand some of these mechanisms better. We're seeing greater convergence of predictions. So just finally, to just sort of touch on that very, very wide range of total sea levels that you, that you mentioned, you know, what we're talking about there with these very, very high numbers, the, you know, the 21 feet that you mentioned, you know, this is really the very, very upper end of the, the distribution. So we, we sort of think about sea level predictions in terms of a, a probability distribution. Now, if you take the, the very, very end of that long tail, it could be, you know, 21 feet. But actually, the, the median value is probably somewhere near, you know, one meter, you know, three or four feet, something like that. Right. You were partly talking about a 2015 paper led by Dave Pollard and Richard Alley as, uh, from Penn State, and they were talking about hydrofracture or cliff failure. And I think this comes down to an issue that I've seen in various blogs and, and emails, people worrying about that instead of flowing into the sea from a pressure in, a, in an orderly way, this ice might just crack off in, in great masses and fall into the sea. Is that kind of the picture that we're discussing here? Absolutely. That's a nice summary. Essentially what the authors have sort of put forward is this, this idea that when a glacier flows into the sea, you know, it might not have a floating tongue like an ice shelf. It might just have a vertical cliff. Uh, and we see this a lot in Greenland, you know, some of the outlet glaciers that are flowing into fjords. They're, they're terminating in the ocean, but they have these vertical faces. Uh, and what happens is that as the flow of the glacier, you know, accelerates their, their fast-flowing glaciers, you get all these longitudinal stresses. So you're basically stretching the ice out as it flows into the ocean. You get a lot of crevassing. And, of course, if you get surface melting, all that water then tends to drain into the crevasses. And it can, 
kind of act as a wedging force. It tries to split those crevasses apart. So combined with all the other stresses that are being applied to this poor little glacier, the the scenario is that these sort of marine terminating uh, glacier margins can basically just collapse of their, their own accord. Now, nobody really debates that that is a, a, a real process. And, you know, when we've seen it for years and, and people have written about tidewater glaciers around the world uh, for many, many decades. The issue with, with the 2015 and 2016 papers was whether that scheme, uh, that mechanism is, is translatable to Antarctica. And if it is, then at what scale can it realistically operate? You know, it's one thing to have a grounded margin in a confined fjord that fractures and, and carves icebergs. But if you then whole scale apply the same mechanism to something like the Ross Sea, where you have a, a floating ice shelf that's maybe you know, a thousand kilometers wide, if you lose that ice shelf, then you have an ice front that's a comparable width. Now, is it realistic to sort of think that that whole ice cliff would be collapsing in the same way as a, a narrow fjord or glacier that's maybe, uh, you know, just a couple of tens of kilometers wide. So lots of uncertainty in, in, in that translation. And Rob DeConto and Dave Pollard were, you know, really pushing the envelope in terms of forcing the community to look at this and say, hey, you know, we, we need to think about this. Is, is this something that, that's going to be important? And, you know, that's how science moves forward. You know, they're absolutely right to do that. So the work that we have to do now is, is for more modeling groups to sort of take this on and try and implement the same process in, in different models and really try and understand what are the sort of physical bounds that control these kind of mechanisms. And if we go back to using very sort of well-constrained engineering type models to understand the stresses and strains, do we get the same results as, as when the Conto and Pollard use their you know, relatively coarse resolution whole continent ice sheet model? So, you know, lots of work to be done to really understand that. For those keeping score at home, we're talking about you can get an update from the paper Revisiting Antarctic Ice Loss Due to Marine Ice Cliff Instability, as published February 6, 2019, in the journal Nature. The lead author is Dr. Tasman Edwards from King's College London, with Nick, our guest, as a co author. So we know, Nick, that the sea is not really level, and sea level rise will not be evenly distributed. As the ice sheets melt, where will the highest waters pile up, and where will the sea level actually go down? Yeah, this is a really interesting one. You know, it, we, we always sort of blindly assume that, you know, as you, as you sort of put water into the ocean, it just sort of fills up like a bathtub. But of course, there's lots of competing factors that uh, complicate that, that pattern, and because of the rotation of the Earth and the, uh, the changing gravitational attraction of these ice sheets when they lose mass, basically because they're smaller, they, they exert a reduced gravitational pull on the ocean surface. So actually the water tends to drop away from the ice sheets because of the, the rotation and the reduced gravitational effects from the ice sheets. Most of the water tends to pile up in the middle latitudes, particularly in the central Pacific. So we start seeing you know, this bulge in the sea level, something like 1.4 times the global mean in the mid-latitude areas, um, particularly sort of Central Pacific and so on. So, you know, near to New Zealand, we obviously have a lot of our population come from um, the Southwest Pacific Islands, which are very low-lying, very vulnerable to that kind of enhanced sea level rise. For people in the U.S., they might be thinking more about friends and relatives in Hawaii, places like that, you know, although you know, the mountains in Hawaii are, are protected to some extent from sea level rise. You know, a lot of the, the development is on, on the low ground um, near to the coast. So, you know, those places are going to be sort of disproportionately affected. Unfortunately, the areas where we're going to see lower sea levels are generally the areas where people don't live. So it's not even as though we can uh, benefit greatly from that. So, so the closer you get to the ice sheet, the, the lower the sea levels um, is going to be. So, you know, around the Antarctic Peninsula, around West Antarctica, you might see a lowering of sea level, but that's not really going to help populations globally, unfortunately. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm your host, Alex Smith. My guest is Dr. Nick Golich from the Antarctic Research Center in Wellington, New Zealand. We're talking about ice sheet melt in Antarctica and Greenland and how that could reshape our world. 
Let's move on to the other paper published in Nature on February 6th. The title is Global Environmental Consequences of 21st Century Ice Sheet Melt. What motivated you, Nick, to do this research? This work came out of previous studies where we had looked at the Antarctic ice sheet, how it was going to change in a warmer world. And in 2015, we published a paper which was very much focused on the very long-term commitments uh, that come from global warming. So this idea that you know, as we warm the climate, we might be able to stabilize the climate at some point, but we set in motion a whole series of changes that are going to play out over hundreds, if not thousands of years. So we did that work in 2015, and sort of on the back of that, started realizing that although that was kind of interesting scientifically, uh, it was very hard to sort of communicate the urgency of climate change to people when you're talking thousands of years in, in the future. So there was kind of a need in my mind to sort of revisit that work and think more specifically about doing predictions for the, the present century and also to think about doing both ice sheets. So uh, in the past, I'd only looked at Antarctica. This time around, I wanted to look at the Greenland ice sheet as well. And because we chose to focus really just on this century, it did give us the advantage that we could run the models at a higher resolution. So the computational costs of going to high resolution mean that it's, it's very hard to do long simulations. But if you're only interested in you know, a century or two, then, then it becomes tractable. So that was kind of the driver for me to sort of start the ice sheet simulations. But I'd also been involved in a number of different studies uh, over the years where we'd, we'd sort of looked at and investigated this interesting sort of feedback mechanism where meltwater from the ice sheets affects ocean circulation and in turn affects the atmosphere. So that was something that I was kind of keen to do as well because up until now, nearly all the publications that have looked at these kind of interactions have always done that in a very conceptual way. It's always been kind of like, oh, let's take X amount of meltwater and a climate state of this, and we'll just put the two together and see what happens. I wanted to kind of redo that in a scenario-based way. So I thought, you know, we're doing the ice sheet simulations according to these representative concentration pathways, the IPCC climate scenarios. I thought we're in a perfect position now to use the outputs from those ice simulations uh, to drive some climate simulations that can tell us about scenario-based climate perturbation. So those were kind of two parts of the, 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 the study, um, and they, they sort of basically formed a, a kind of natural alliance in my mind. So that's kind of where we went with that. Reading the two new papers, I got a small enlightenment, I think, but I could be off base. I'm not a scientist. But previously, most of my guests talked about the impact of warmer temperatures in the air and the ocean and how that would affect ice melt in Greenland and Antarctica. But it seems to me your team is saying the opposite almost. Ice melt will affect air temperatures and ocean currents. So is that a feedback or is that just the way this planet constantly interacts from both ends? Mm. It's a complicated planet, isn't it? Um, we live in a world where we have so many complex interactions. And, and, you know, as scientists, particularly as modelers, we're sort of trying to take apart the system and say, you know, what influences what? And of course, Everything is interlinked so tightly that it's very hard to sort of find a starting point and say, well, let's start with this thing and see how it affects the other thing, because that other thing then affects something else, which affects something else, which then comes back to the first thing. So we, we sort of acknowledge that sort of interconnected aspect of, uh, of, of the Earth system. And I guess what we try and do in most modeling experiments is try to sort of understand just one part of the puzzle. So we kind of know... I think fairly well how you know, changes in the atmosphere and changes in the ocean lead to changes in the ice sheet. But there's not been as much work done looking at you know, how changes in the ice sheet affect the, the ocean and atmospheres. And the new paper resurrects another debate that's been going on for quite a long time. Many of us saw the movie The Day After Tomorrow. It shows North America rapidly freezing over, basically because the warm Gulf Stream stops flowing north. And scientists came out and quashed that as sci-fi and, and forget about it. But, in fact, many in the scientific community have been saying nothing significant will happen to the North Atlantic overturning circulation, as scientists refer to it, for centuries to come. Your new paper stirs it up, suggesting we will see noticeable changes 
to those warming currents, even during this century. What's up? You know, in the last couple of years, there is definitely more and more evidence that the strength of that overturning circulation has decreased in recent times. So it's something that we can observe. It's no longer a kind of what if. I mean, we know that it's weakening. I guess the question on most people's minds is, you know, will the weakening continue? Will it accelerate? Will we uh, reach this point where it collapses? You know, one of the key things about the AMOC, this overturning circulation, is that it's a system that has been known for a long time to be essentially sort of, you know, bistable. You know, it, it, it can exist in its current state, or if it's perturbed enough, if we, if we dis- disrupt it enough, it can basically collapse. By that, we mean that the strength of the overturning reduces very, very rapidly to a point where the ocean circulation is, is in a very different kind of mode than it is now. And the interesting thing here is that this is a threshold type system. So we're kind of, we're working in a space where you can kind of gradually keep nudging something. It's kind of like pushing a boulder further and further towards the cliff edge. At some point, you get to a point where it just drops off the cliff. And that's what happens with the AMOC. You can push it and push it and push it, and then bang, it collapses. So depending on which models you look at, you might find that point of collapse might, might differ slightly. Um, but we, we kind of know it's that sort of system. So that's why people are worried about it. I guess when people have done climate model simulations, ocean model simulations, um, they haven't included the ice sheet melt. And yet we know that there's this big sort of cold blob uh, in the ocean around uh, Greenland because of the, uh, the, the meltwater coming off the ice sheet. So we know the meltwater is going in there and we know uh, that it's likely to be having an effect on the, the overturning circulation. And so it kind of seems you know, at least consistent that in our simulations we see a, a 15% reduction in the, in the strength of the overturning, I think you know, starting around the mid-century and only taking a few decades uh, which is quite kind of scary. So the question then is, you know, does 15% reduction matter? You know, we've seen a 15% reduction in strength over the last few decades. You know, if this adds to it, then we've got, you know, 30% reduction. How much further do we have to push it before we get to that collapse state? So, you know, it's an area that sparks a lot of interest and a lot of debate. And one of the reasons is, of course, because, you know, we're talking about a huge system here. I mean, we, we, we can observe sort of tiny fractions of it, but really we rely on numerical models to understand it. And of course, the best way to understand it from a numerical model is to run lots and lots of different models and have lots of different groups doing this kind of thing. So the more that we do that, the the more we get a sense of what a robust, you know, realistic response will be. So I'd say, you know, the work we've done is enough to kind of flag it as a, a, a warning Well, there's another warning in the paper talking about climate chaos from ice sheet melt, which is something we wouldn't normally think about. The new paper says, quote, perhaps more immediately impactful than gradual warming is the possibility of enhanced interannual temperature variability, which would result in more widespread or more frequent terrestrial and marine heat waves. How could the process of melting ice at the poles increase the size or frequency of heat waves in the lands where we live? Yeah, it's difficult to sort of track these things to sort of individual events or processes. I, I guess what we're seeing in our climate model, which I, you know, I, I caution is a, a low resolution climate model by many standards. But essentially, the, the picture is this, that we put the meltwater into the ocean and that disrupts the ocean circulation close to the ice sheet. But that means that ocean circulation doesn't move the heat around the globe the way that it normally would. So when we think about sort of heat in the atmosphere, heat in the ocean, we can think of it as in this kind of constant state of flux, that heat is moving from one area to another, very much like traffic, you know, going around a roundabout or something like that. Now, as soon as you put a broken down truck in that roundabout, the flow of those cars, you know, it goes haywire, you know, and that's exactly what's happening in the ocean. We put in this this melt and then the ocean circulation kind of breaks down a little bit or you know, maybe that current that used to go from one place to another kind of diverts slightly or it weakens or it flows at a different depth. You know, these are all possible responses. And of course, the ocean is trading heat with the atmosphere. In some areas, it's taking it up. Some areas, it's, it's releasing it. So that's why it impacts the atmosphere. 
the reason that we get this stop-start variability is because you know, when it comes to the ice sheets, even though we're applying these gradual warmings, the way that the ice sheet responds is definitely not smooth and linear. The, the ice sheet has these episodic bursts where something uh, happens and you get more discharge, and then it maybe finds a, a place where it can stabilize, so discharge slows down, and then we get more acceleration when it reaches another part of, sort of ocean warming or whatever. So that means the input of melt to the oceans is also episodic, and so that gives you this stop-start in the ocean circulation and, and really disrupts the way that the atmospheric system responds to that. That totally makes sense. I appreciate that. Now, we're starting to wrap up here, but I have another James Hansen quote, this time from the Independent newspaper in 2017. He said, I don't think we're going to get four or five degrees this century because we get a cooling effect from the melting ice. Is it true that melting ice could slightly slow down global warming despite our greenhouse gas emissions? Absolutely. And there was a paper in Nature last year by Ben Bronselaar and others uh, where they highlighted basically the same effect that that we talk about. Um, And they they were looking particularly at the impact of uh, Antarctic ice sheet melt, whereas we've looked at uh, Antarctic and Greenland. But yes, essentially what we find and what they find is that we, we might have an overall reduction in global warming under a, an RCP 8.5 type scenario of around 0.3 of a degree. So to put that in context, that's something a little less than 10%. So we, we might reduce the overall amount of warming by you know maybe 8% or something like that. The problem is that, of course, those changes will be spatially variable. So in some areas close to where the meltwater is going into the oceans, you'll see much larger reductions in air temperature or reduced warming more to the point. Whereas in other areas, you'll see actually enhanced warming. And uh, this comes back to what we were saying before about the, you know, the disrupted ocean circulations. So one thing that we sort of tried to map out in the paper was just which areas were going to see enhanced warming and which areas would see slightly mollified warming And yeah, I mean, it it certainly gives you a very interesting sense of where the winners and losers are. And and unfortunately, it looks like some of the enhanced warming would be around sort of eastern Canada into the Arctic, a little bit in Central America because of the slowdown of the Gulf Stream. You know, a lot more of the heat is trapped down there. Northwest Europe would have slightly uh, reduced warming because the heat transport across the North Atlantic basically reduces. So Yeah, winners and losers. And, um, you know, again, I would just say that this is one model simulation. And what we really need are, you know, lots more simulations that are doing this kind of thing to really refine our our sense of where these extra warmings are going to be and where the reduced warmings are going to be. Well, as we wrap up, can you just briefly give us a hint of what you might be working on next? Well, what we're actively working on at the moment is trying to do a more robust job in terms of coupling our ice sheet simulations to climate models. So we made a start in this paper in terms of just sort of taking a a two-way interaction between the ice sheet and the, the climate models. But we need to do that in a way that captures much shorter term changes. So rather than running one model, taking the outputs, putting them into another, running that model, and then kind of iterating like that, we need to be exchanging outputs from the two models, you know, much more frequently during the simulations. It's it's computationally a lot more intensive to do that. It's a lot more difficult to do it. It takes a bit of time to kind of get that right, but that's definitely where we need to go. And, you know, a lot of this comes back to the point that you raised earlier about, you know, what thing is driving what other thing. You know, we need to understand more fully how these different interactions work, how the feedbacks work, and, and really, you know, coupled models uh, are the only way to do that. Well, we'll send you a football-sized server firm and uh, see what you can do with that. <laughs> From the Antarctic Research Center at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, we've been speaking with Dr. Nicholas Golich. He's part of two papers just published in Nature. They are Revisiting Antarctic Ice Loss Due to Marine Ice Cliff Instability and Global Environmental Consequences of 21st Century Ice Sheet Melt. You can find links to both and other supporting papers and articles, including Paul Beckwith's video on all this, in my show blog at ecoshock.org 
Nick, I know you've been swamped. Thank you for coming through for our Radio EcoShock listeners. No problem at all. Thank you. I'm Alex Smith reporting. Thank you for keeping up with the latest on Radio EcoShock, and thank you for caring about your world.